Rachel Ziegler, the 22-year-old actress cast as the new Snow White, has clearly been doing a bang-up job promoting her upcoming role as the fairest of them all. Let's see what she has to say about the first ever Disney princess. I just mean that it's no longer 1937, and we absolutely wrote a Snow White she's that is... She's not going to be yeah, saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince, and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. So, tell me, Rachel, what exactly is wrong with dreaming about true love? I mean, you know, the, the original cartoon came out in 1937, and very evidently so. <laughs> um, there is a big focus on her love story um, with a guy who literally stalks her. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Super weird. Super weird. So we didn't do that this time. <laughs> so, no, so no prince or a different kind of prince? We have a different approach to what I'm sure a lot of people will assume is a love story just because, like, we cast a guy in the movie, right. Andrew Burnap, great dude. Yeah. Um, it's a... Uh, it's, one of those things that I think everyone's going to have their assumptions about what it's actually going to be, but uh, it's really not about the love story at all, which is really, really wonderful. And whether or not she finds love along the way is anybody's guess until 2024. Um, all of Andrew's scenes could get cut. Who knows? I was scared of the original cartoon. I think I watched it once and then I never picked it up again. <laughs> like, I'm being so serious. I watched it once and then I went on the ride in Disney World, which was called Snow White's Scary Adventures doesn't sound like something a little kid would like, was terrified of it, never revisited Snow White again. Wow, she really doesn't like Snow White, does she? It's Hollywood, baby. Look, no hatred towards this young actress who's doing her very best to be the new Jennifer Lawrence. I have not talked to Jennifer Lawrence, but if she wants to call me, she can. we can hang out anytime. I'm obsessed with her. I love her so much. At her age, it's commonplace for people to parrot the various ideas that they've been inundated with by gender studies professors and liberal arts students posing as Hollywood writers, all of whom strongly believe that women shouldn't be graceful, demure, gentle, modest, cooperative, and least of all, interested in marriage or motherhood. So basically, according to these writers, women should not be like Snow White. After all, she represents all of those things, and let's not forget her great propensity to do housework, which honestly just makes feminists lose their mind. So I have two questions. First, why does modern representation of female stories have to be devoid of love? And second, if Snow White is such an antiquated and irrelevant character, why is it that after 211 years since the story was originally written, and 86 years since the original movie was released, we still talk about the character? Why do little girls dress up like her? And why have there been so many adaptations of her story? To understand this, I went back and read the original Brothers Grimm fairy tale, as well as watched the 1937 movie, and I could completely understand the impulse to criticize her. Snow White is shown to be achingly naive, content in her miserable life of endless toil, all while making musical wishes for love by a well. She's flighty and shy, and in her own story, pretty passive. I mean, she's unconscious for a lot of it, and has to be rescued by a kiss from the prince, who promptly carries her away to a great kingdom. But is this a fair representation of the story? No, but I'll explain that later. Because first, we need to talk about the true modern-day princess. And no, I don't mean Jasmine, Belle, Ariel, or even Meghan Markle. I mean Samantha Jones. Hello. It's over. I told my wife. Who is this? Since her television debut back in 1998, Samantha Jones has dominated as a feminist icon. And while the wokeness wave has ravaged the once adored characters of Carrie Bradshaw, Charlotte York, and even Miranda Hobbs, Samantha has had staying power thanks to her cheeky lines and unapologetic confidence. I'm a trisexual. I'll try anything once. While the other girls dreamed and fell into love, albeit reluctantly for Miranda, Samantha found her forever with Smith, realized she hated it, and quickly took a U-turn and planted herself firmly in Single City. Samantha's independence and affluence has made her incredibly attractive to feminists everywhere. She's a powerful high earner that never needs to take any crap, and with her voracious sexual appetite, complete disinterest in emotional connection with men, and general disdain for children, Samantha is the ultimate counterforce to the patriarchy. Common criticisms of the patriarchy include the fact that men run the world, and as such want to keep women out of powerful positions and lock them into marriages where they can be effectively subjugated by their husbands. So dreaming of love is bad. Because because it's akin to yearning for a man, yearning to be made whole by another person, yearning to be rescued by a man, and in doing so, handing over all of your power. The Samantha Jones feminist perspective is that it is wrong to need anyone. What's interesting, though, is that over the six-season run of the show and the two movies that followed, Samantha has two instances of what 
she might call weakness, where she truly craves the love of a man. The first comes when she is sick with the flu and realizes that the various men in her life that she engages in casual sex with are only interested in, surprise, surprise, coming over for casual sex. Honey. I can hardly blow my nose, let alone blow you. This leads her to make a shocking revelation. I should have gotten married. It doesn't matter how much you have. If you don't have a guy who cares about you, it don't mean shit. <laughs> but when she's back on her feet, she quickly rejects that notion of needing anyone. Speaking of annoying dependencies, let's talk about breaking out of bad habits. It is so hard. I finally had to get dressed, go out and pick up a guy. Well, that's one way to do it, but our sponsor Fume has a different way of looking at it. Because not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So what if you could just take the bad out of habit? Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all natural, delicious flavors. So why be bad when you can be good with Fume? Your Fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your bad habit. And it looks stylish too. Speaking of flavors, Fume has unveiled some exciting new cores, and I was genuinely surprised. I was expecting something a little subtle, but it's bold, it's flavorful, and very fresh. And I love fidgeting with it. And it looks stylish too. So if you're looking for a tool that's going to support you through breaking a bad habit, then check out Fume. It's already helped over 100,000 people take control of their habits. Check out Fume at tryfume.com slash baggage claim, or scan the QR code and use code baggage claim to get 10% off on the journey pack. That's try F-U-M dot com and use code baggage claim to save an additional 10% off on your order today. Okay, back to the video and let's talk about the second time that Samantha needed the support of a man. This time when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And here, Smith is actually willing to take care of her. But some years later, when she's fighting fit again, Samantha escapes out of that relationship. I love you but I love me more." and commits herself to her bachelorhood. Samantha's frustration with relationships, a frustration that the anti-love feminists share, is the necessity to compromise. I have no real connection to our life here. And my managing you. It's, it's getting to be too much. I'm starting to resent it. For the last two years, it's been all about you. Well, for the first three years, it was all about you. I know. That was so much more fun. To make any relationship work, there is a level of compromise necessary from both parties, like compromise of time, independence, and a change in priorities. But to postmodern feminists and to Samantha, this translates to giving up power. And it's this obsession with power that dictates that women should not wish for love, but rather look to lead. This is yet another criticism of the original Snow White story, for not orienting women everywhere to seek out leadership. The reality is that the cartoon was made 85 years ago and therefore it's extremely dated when it comes to the ideas of women being in roles of power and, uh, and what a woman is fit for in the world. And so when we came to reimagining the actual role of Snow White, it became about the fairest of them all, meaning who is the most just and who uh, can become a fantastic leader. And the reality is, you know, Snow White has to learn a lot of lessons about coming into her own power before she can come into power over a kingdom. But hey, they forgot that it was the queen and not the king that has all the power in the original story. And this brings us to what I think is actually the biggest problem the feminists have with Snow White, the evil queen. The modern proclamations on female representation absolutely forbids negative representation of women, especially of women in power. So no doubt, in the newest installment, her evilness will be explained away and justified by being caused by some man that oppressed her and didn't accept her for who she is and thus made her insecure about aging. This is the modern approach, you guys. All female problems are directly caused by men. So the movie will probably end with some speech from Snow White that will melt the evil queen's heart and the two of them will link hands and unleash their wrath on the real villain of the story, a man. And then they'll walk off into the sunset because women can need other women naturally, but any partnership with a man is beyond traitorous. And there you have it, the modern take on Snow White that will really just be a propagandist lecture and a massive talking down to for men and women everywhere. It will lose money at the box office and the creators and actors 
actors will blame the racist and sexist nature of audiences as a justification for their failure. So if we go back to the real story of Snow White, what exactly do Snow White and the Evil Queen signify? Well, the Queen represents the perils of vanity, or let's use the more appropriate term for it narcissism. And Snow White's ability to dethrone her as the fairest of them all is not about Snow White's youthful allure. It's because of her inner beauty. This is why the mirror tells the queen that she has to eat Snow White's heart. The queen tries to take that literally, but again, that's symbolic of what makes Snow White beautiful. It's not her flesh, it's her heart. And while the queen is outwardly beautiful, her disguise is what reveals her true self. And what about Snow White? What about her makes her the fairest of them all? It's her spirit. Even in the darkest of times, betrayed and cast out by her only family, from her only home and abandoned in a dark forest, it's her ability to pull herself together and her willingness to see the good around her. And when she comes across a place of possible safety, her first instinct is to start cleaning it. Again, many people will see this as a patriarchal brainwashing attempt to convince young girls everywhere to start cooking and cleaning. But I see this as her desire to do her part, to make her corner of this earth beautiful, to take pride in where she is. When she sees work that needs doing, she takes it on and looks to earn her keep in the safety of someone else's home, rather than just expecting shelter for nothing. And this is what makes everyone around her love her so much and want to do anything to help her, to protect her and save her. It's Snow White's goodness that emboldens the dwarves to fight and destroy the powerful queen. And it's Snow White's goodness that makes them unwilling to bury her alive because unbeknownst to the dwarves, Snow is not dead but unconscious. Snow White is not a passive protagonist. She is the representation of an ideal that inspires the dwarves to overthrow a powerful tyrant, all in the defense of Snow White's enduring spirit and kindness in the face of terrible malevolence. But these are the qualities that the New Age feminists cannot appreciate because they, like the evil queen, are consumed by their vanity and desire for power. So how could they ever understand, let alone appreciate, the true value of Snow White?